All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Sing joyfully to God all the earth. The Lord hath made known his salvation. Words taken from the gradual this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We confess in the creed that his majesty, Christ our Lord, came propter nos homines et propter nostrum salutem. He came on account of us men and our salvation. But the exact nature of the relationship between Christ coming among us and our salvation remains undefined. From theology, we know that salvation is a work that only His Majesty can do. He is both God and man. He's two what's and one who. He is divine and human in His natures, but one in His person. And with this hypostatic union, we know that it is clearly something He can do. He can save man. And we also know that Man is in need of salvation. So one would think that given a proper understanding of the hypostatic union of Christology and the fallen state of mankind, one could formulate with some ease a simple statement stating that this is what Christ did to bring about man's salvation. However, since the effects of original sin are manifold, they're various, they're diverse, the cure is most likely to be manifold as well, at least in how we think about it and consider it. For example, we can think fallen man needs to be healed. He needs to be healed of his wounds. Fallen man needs to be instructed. Fallen man must offer reparation to God, whom he has offended, to name only a few things that need to be done. His majesty, because he is both true God and true man, unites these diverse duties of a Savior in himself, making Christ our Lord the perfect mediator between the just and merciful God and sinful man. Furthermore, the scriptures present a variety of images to capture what his majesty came to accomplish. He's the good shepherd. He's the teacher. He's the lamb of sacrifice. He's the king. He's the vine. He's the prophet spoken of by Moses. All of which point to the complexity of the relationship between Savior and the saved. And finally, the fathers and the doctors of the church, considering these duties and scriptural images, came up with seven ways. Seven ways, and there's maybe more, but basically it can be reduced to seven. Seven ways His Majesty saves fallen man, which could be labeled in the following way. Pedagogical, transactional, recapitulation, physical, sacrificial, satisfactory, and meritorious. Seven in all. Although we are mostly interested in the physical theory, physical way he saved us at this time due to the season of Christmas, let us nevertheless look into them all, even if only briefly, with the goal of looking into the physical one at the end. Now they go together, and there is to be expected that there'll be some overlapping. And also we should realize with St. Thomas and all the saints that whenever you take one thing and make it the only thing, you get in trouble. So you need to look at them all. Whenever somebody takes just one of them and says, this is it, they get in trouble. So let's look at them. Let's look at three today. First, the pedagogical. The pedagogical way emphasizes Christ as teacher revealing the saving message, the gospel, the word of God. It seems to be the predominant explanation used during the first two centuries of the church. The apostolic fathers and the apologists, with the possible exception of Justin Martyr, 
mostly mention Christ's life and teachings from which they seem to draw their inspiration. A devotion to these teachings, to the gospel and the way Christ lived according to the apostolic fathers would foster a good Christian life, which seemed to be their intention rather than any speculation as to how salvation actually takes place. So we have this ancient phrase, docere verbo et exemplo, to teach by way of word and example. That's why we have sermons. This is why we have catechism. Now, when somebody takes the pedagogical and says that's all there is, what do they end up in? Well, we know the answer to that. They become Pelagian. That's a heresy that has been condemned. Christ did not just come to teach us the way he did much more. First one, pedagogical. Second one, a second way proposed by the fathers, sometimes called transactional or redemption. This expression of the saving work of Christ seems to have its foundation in the position that man, through the fall, came under the dominion of the devil and of death. So Christ came and redeemed us or bought us back. That's what redemption is, a buying back from the devil, as it were, by paying the price with his own death. St. Thomas didn't really like this uh, way of thinking very much because you don't pay the devil. And he wondered, well, who are you paying? Are you paying God or are you paying the devil? So he tended to avoid it. But in any case, the fathers talk about this and they say that Christ broke the power of death by his own death. His passion and death was offered in exchange for man to buy him back. Thus, St. Peter expresses this in his first letter. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. And of course, you can find many other passages that say the same thing. So Satan, it was argued, had some claim over mankind. For man had sinned by listening to his advice. But the devil abused this power by acting against the sinless Christ over whom he had no dominion at all. And thereby he forfeit whatever rights or permissions he may have had over mankind. It is important to note here that whatever permissions or rights the devil may have were granted to him by God. It is commonly considered the devil has no rights. He simply has permissions from God to do things based upon how we sin. There's no dualism in God's universe. For the devil has no rights and owes not only all his permissions, but even his very being to God. So some call him the policeman of God, the jailer of God. Someone breaks the law, the policeman is there going, he broke the law, I have a right to go get him. And so Christ comes, looks like sin, but is not, and the devil loses the case. I think the Protestants overblow that one. They're kind of a ledger approach to salvation. Well, I'm in this ledger, but then when I accept Christ as my Savior, I'm now transferred over into the other ledger and I'm saved. It's over. I've been bought back by Christ. Once again, you take one of these by itself, you will end in heresy. They go together. So that's the transactional or redemption, redemptive way we're saved. Now there's the third way we'll talk about today and that is the way of satisfaction, reparation. Because Adam's sin, being a rejection of God, has an aspect of infinity about it. He offended an infinite God. It is so big, no single man, nor all men combined over all time could make up for the sin. But if man is to be saved, he himself needs to make up for the sin. 
He needs to fulfill justice as man. But given the nature of the sin, only God is able to do it. Not even an angel could satisfy divine justice in this matter. Thus, there must be some union of God and man that would make this possible. The union that God willed is, of course, what we call the hypostatic union, the union of the human nature and the divine nature in the second person of the Holy Trinity. It is our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, given that satisfaction is the reparation demanded from the offender by the offended. The payment for sin is death. And so the payment is made through His majesty. This penalty is imposed on Christ instead of mankind. And in this way, God is merciful towards man while at the same time fulfilling the requirements of His justice. We should end today. A little summary we can ask ourselves once again. Why did Christ come at Christmas? One of the main reasons is to save us. Other reasons are he came for the glory of God, to glorify God. That's number one. He came into the world so that God would be perfectly known and loved in his creation. That's another reason. But he also came, as the creed says, to save us. And how did he actually carry out this most vital work? So far, we have covered by way of satisfaction of God's justice, by way of word and example, he showed us how to get to heaven, the pedagogical, and by way of buying us back with the price being his own life and blood and death, redemption or transactional. Now tomorrow, we'll take up the other ways and we'll aim toward an explanation of that physical way that he saved us that I think has been so abused in modern time and why we're going through these things at this moment. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.